Awesome, great. Okay, well, welcome everyone to the sixth and final session of the Chinatown Reimagined Forum. Um, as Vincent introduced, my name is Sandra Singh, and for the past three years, I've had the privilege of serving as the general manager for the City of Vancouver's Art, Culture, and Community Services Department, which, um, as some of you may know, co-sponsors the current transformation work in Chinatown with the city's planning department. And more recently, I was honored to be the city's appointee to the board of the new Chinese Canadian Museum Society of BC. And of course, I have the pleasure of serving as your moderator for this afternoon's final session. I'd also like to take this moment to acknowledge that um, I'm speaking from the unceded territory, uh, traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Youth Nations, and that our collective work in Chinatown and across Vancouver takes place on these unceded lands. And I'm grateful, and I, I'm sure we all are, for their ongoing welcome, graciousness, and stewardship. Over the past two days, we have each gained insight and heard ideas proposed by the many presenters and panelists regarding Chinatown. No doubt those insights will help inform this next conversation. The format for this session is similar to those from earlier today. I'll provide a very brief introduction to each of the panelists, and then each panelist will speak for approximately 10 minutes, seven to 10 minutes, and we'll then, then have some time for questions, answers, and discussion, followed by one or two final reflections from each of our speakers. For those who can stay with us a bit longer after today's session, after the end of the session, we'll have a short video and then offer some concluding remarks for the overall forum. So the title, as Vincent mentioned, for this final session and our time together this afternoon is The Past, Present, and Future of Chinatown, a very apt conclusion for the preceding sessions. Our presenters today, each of them thought and community leaders, will reflect on the history and trajectory of our collaborative effort as community partner organizations and government to chart an exciting path forward, one that draws from, respects, and honors the past while setting sights on a bold and exciting future. We will hear from them their ideas for forward-thinking actions that will help us continue our work together to transform Chinatown into the dynamic cultural heritage site for Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and the world that we all want to see. So without further ado, please let me introduce our first speaker, Mr. Fred Ma. For those of us who know and work in Chinatown, Fred needs little introduction. He has been a tireless visionary leader, advocate, organizer, and mentor for and in Chinatown for over four decades. Given this incredible tenure, Fred's contributions are too numerous to mention now in detail. They could take the entire session as we all know. So I'll just highlight a few. In 2017, Fred was a leader in urging the city for the historic apology toward the Chinese Canadian community for historic discrimination. Those efforts led to many important legacy actions, including the commitment for the city and community to work together to explore the feasibility for applying for a UNESCO World Heritage Site designation for Chinatown. Fred is currently the president of the Chinatown Society Heritage Buildings Association of Vancouver and is co-sponsor of the Cultural Heritage Working Group for the City of Vancouver's Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group. His biography on the website is a testament to his deep and decades-long commitment to this neighborhood and city. Welcome, Fred. Thank you, Sanja, for a kind introduction. Uh, I'm speaking from the uh, traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slater Tooth. Um, you know, because I'm a low tech guy, I don't have any slides or uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I uh, just speak from my head. So, you know, I, you know, before I start, I just want to give you a little bit of a history about my family. Okay. Um, my Grandfather came over to Canada to build a railway. My father came over in 1911, paid $50 a head tax. I and my mother did not come over at all until 1949, after the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. In 1949, October, we landed in Vancouver. And it was a dismal scene in Chinatown. I, I'll give you a picture of what it's like. What happens is that, you know, those days it was very foggy. But what's really depressing was that you don't see children or women on the streets. Many men sat, sat on the stairs of Carnegie Center 
so social life. And that's the impression, first impression I got of Canada. And it was very, very depressing. At that time, I was only 14 years old. I was wondering what's going on. And, you know, so, you know, that's my background, my family background. So anyway, after uh, university, a few of us got together to join at that time, what we call the Haiphong Association. The Haiphong Association at that time uh, was formed in actual fact in the fifties by a group of youth so that they can socialize and play chess and so on and so forth. And in joining that um, group, what we did is that, you know, because at that time there was no such thing as English as a second language. What we did is that we said, okay, there are many garment workers who cannot speak English. How can they learn? What we said is, uh, okay, what we'll do is that we, we are volunteer to teach English as a second language. What we did is that we published our own uh, material and get uh, at that time uh, by the name of uh, Mary Chan, who actually introduced the garment workers to the factories. And Mary Chan is Siri Chan's, you probably know Siri Chan. Mary Chan is Siri Chan's mother. So what she did is that, you know, we'll ask her whether the factory workers were interested in, learn, in learning English. And if they were uh, interested, what we would do is uh, teach them once or twice a week. After uh, they get off from work at five o'clock. And as a result, we started this English program, but with you know, the larger community, we started many things, many activities, such as, you know, we had Chinese chess tournament. We were fortunate, you know, one uh, wealthy person uh, for Ying Dong, but I don't know uh, what his English name is. He's from, originally from Hong Kong. He was from Hong Kong. And uh, he offered, say, look, we'll sponsor the International Chinese Chess Tournament. Anybody besides somebody's Chinese descent, I would put up a price of $1 million. And we had that going on for five years. And what happens, unfortunately, no one uh, from outside of Chinese descent have won that tournament. And then what we did is that we had also things like basketball. We play at the Gibbs Boys Club. We had 12 teams. We had volleyball tournaments. At, at that time, the Ding Ho drive-in parking lot. And then we said we had table tennis, which is very, very popular. For many years, we, did, we had the Canadian champion for table tennis, and also the Canadian junior uh, championship. Many of you know the junior championship was held by um, uh, Peter Joe. And, you know, what we had was international Chinatown Open uh, Championship. And we had uh, world champions come into Chinatown to uh, compete for many years. These are the things that we did, you know, and besides that, uh, you know, there, at the same time, there were many problems, but, you know, many problems, when I say many problems, such as um, the Spoder fight about, you know, development of Stracona. But you know, with these many fights, like the freeway fight and so on and so forth, many of you already know about that, and I'm not going to go into it in uh, any detail. In 1972, the Wong Association called the organization together 
to the form the board of the Chinese Cultural Center. In actual fact, you know, forming the Chinese Cultural Center was suggested uh, by, at that time, Attorney General for BC, uh, Alex McDonald. And, you know, because of Wong's association got everybody together, they uh, actually, the board made up of 21 people uh, was formed. I was not on the board. They asked me to be a volunteer English secretary. But after a year or so, we see that the board wasn't moving ahead with actually building the center itself for various reasons. So some of us got together and said, look, do we, what do we need? to move this ahead. And what we did is we, did, we decided to get people outside the community involved as well. We decided to expand the board from 21 to 31. We got people involved from UBC. For instance, Dr. S. Wallown, he agreed to run for the chair. At that time, he's the founding uh, uh, dean of the dental school. We got Dr. Yuori Chung, who was the department head for surgery of UBC. And at the same time, we also got young people. For instance, Joy Chow at that time was the chair of the Chinese Students Association. Bing Tom and I went out there to talk to the Students Association as the, what we, at that time, there was also a Chinese Velocity Club. We talked to both of these clubs and say, look, we need the youth to join us, which several of, us, uh, of, of, of them did. And, and Georgia was one of them. In addition, what we did is we talked to some professional people, like lawyers, bankers, and also people from different areas. Uh, one is a different areas outside of Chinatown. You know, for instance, that we got uh, somebody from uh, South Africa to sit on a board. Singapore, you know, some of you may have heard of S.K. Lee. He was a top lawyer in Singapore. And many of you don't know about Lum Lai, but their family used to own a diamond mine in South Africa. And these, we got all these people involved, you know, so that there's diversity as well. And then we got a couple of bankers involved. And, you know, so that they will assist in, in us in fundraising. Once we started that going, we got different activity. You know, when I say different activities, we encourage different groups to form like the Penjing Society, like the Chiangai uh, Photo Photographic Society, different dance groups, different choral groups, and, and so on. You know, that way, what we had was different cultural groups that can participate in things like the Spring Festival, which we organized in 1974. And in 1975, we had the Mid-Autumn Festival. So these things that we created in order to get, to get people interested in the Chinese Cultural Center so they can open their wallets. You know, there were also two, as I said, uh, different struggles. For instance, you know, the provincial government would not support us. But what we did was that we had one group of good guys who belonged to the Socrat party. We had a group of bad guys like myself and Bing Tom and so on, and say, look, if you don't give us any money, when they were lobbying and also come down to Chinatown to speak, we said, we'll demonstrate. And that way, we got $100,000 from the provincial government. At the same time, we also had to fight the federal government as well. 
when I say fight the federal government at that time, one minister called Simo Holt, she was completely against us. You know, under the Habitat, UN Habitat Conference, there were $9 million allocated to Vancouver for distribution to different uh, NGO organizations. Because Sima Hope was in control of that $9 million, she was completely against us. And what happened? We said, look, if we don't get her out of there, we will be, you know, not be recognized by the federal government. So what we did, we, we looked at the districts we see represented, how many Chinese live there? And what's the second, the, the last election was the second uh, party. So what we did is that we decided the second party to run, we would support the second party. At that time, it was Ian Wardell. And what we did is that we went through the total folk and select everybody from the, with the Chinese name in the district. And we wrote it down and we lobby and we phoned every one of them to come out and vote for the NDP. Because at that time, you know, we found that you know, there was only a few hundred votes the last election, only a few hundred votes difference. And that's how Ian Wardell won the, the, the seat in Vancouver Kingsway. And, in, and Sim Hope was defeated. And as a result, we had much more success sailing with the federal government. And with the city, you know, even though we had long discussions, uh, we, didn't, we, we got the land for one year, for one dollar per year for 50 years. But at the same time, uh, we did not get any money from the city. So I'm not sure that how much time I got. Uh, two minutes? Okay, you know, to wrap up, what I would like to say is that even though that we had our own problem, you know, what our, whatever uh, our neighbors do will affect us. Whatever we do will affect our neighbors. You know, uh, because right now, it's very, you know, we are affected by downtown east side problems. Homelessness, uh, drug, and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and mental problems. And what happens? During the first Vancouver Agreement, during the Vancouver Agreement, we, even though we had difficulties, but we supported the safe injection site. And also, too, we fundraise for the Carnegie Center. So what I'm hoping is that, you know, for the next few years, what we have to do is work with our neighbor to come up with a solution. When I say come up with a solution, if the solution has to be a three level of the government cooperating with each other. And what happens, cooperating with each other so that what we can do is move forward to solve some of these problems of homelessness, mental health, and addiction. Thank you very much. Um, Fred, thank you so much for that. That was, you covered so much um, in there in terms of your description of how you worked with your neighbors and the community from like the grassroots organizing um, at the, you know, um, after your university years through the creation of the Chinese Cultural Center, your engagement with youth and with diverse professionals, reaching out beyond Chinatown to engage the whole community. And then, and then really, I think really um, strategic um, uh, work to influence government, both through external pressure as well as internal relationships. And that, that's how systems change. And so that was that was that was really really incredible. Thank you for sharing that um, that uh, how we got here today. And and then your your comments around moving forward, recognizing the interrelationship of, of neighborhoods and the work that we need to collectively do 
uh, for for the health of, of of these critical neighborhoods in our in our downtown east side. So thank you for that. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce our next speaker, Michael Tan. Michael is a finance and operations executive who many know in this community with an extraordinary track record of building global scale technology companies under hyper growth conditions, including Hootsuite and Unbounce. And now he serves as the VP at Dave & Motors. As a community member, Michael is recognized as an effective and dedicated community leader and advocate for Chinatown. He, current, he is currently the co-chair of the City Council appointed Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group and is also a member of both the Vancouver, City of Vancouver's Northeast Falls Creek Chinatown Working Group and the Andy Livingston Park and Chinatown Memorial Plaza Redesign Working Group. Michael is also the vice president of the Chowlin Society, a nonprofit organization that manages a non-market housing complex. Um, and just to make us all feel inadequate. In addition to all of that, Michael also practices and teaches martial arts. I don't know how you have time to do all this. It's quite something. Um, welcome, Michael. Thanks so much for that uh, glowing introduction, Sandra. I, I, I'll try to live up to that. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Sandra said, uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm Michael Tan, uh, one of the co-chairs for the Vancouver uh, Chinatown LSG Legacy Stewardship Group. Um, the LSG is a Vancouver City Council appointed body, which it not only advises the council, but works directly with city staff on um, actions to conserve the unique cultural heritage of Vancouver's Chinatown for future generations, specifically through um, a UNESCO World Heritage Site um, designation and uh, an application towards that. And it was formed in 2018 as part of the process of reconciliation when Vancouver City Council apologized for the actions of council's past and their role in the historical discrimination against Chinese people, real racism. Everyone, um, no matter their background or ethnicity, when I mention Chinatown, you know, their people's eyes light up, you know, because so many people have that strong connection to Chinatown. For most people, um, it's the amazing food that they, you know, re remember, you know, trying with their friends um, or coming down to have dim sum with their family. I love Chinatown, you know, people will usually say to me. And people love Chinatown and are so passionate about Chinatown because, but um, they're so passionate that sometimes people will forget that Chinatown's history is one of racism and historical discrimination. You know, because that, you know, Chinese people were not safe outside the neighborhood. You know, one could not live or own property outside of Chinatown. Um, and that it is through that context um, that Chinatown was born as a, as a community of inclusivity. If you weren't white, Anglo-Saxon, you know, you weren't safe um, outside of Chinatown. At Manning Union, at the site of actually the original uh, Chowlin Society's uh, building, um, which was expropriated by the city, you know, during uh, in the 60s to build the, the viaduct, another one of these uh, racist policies. Um, you know, the, our four story building was home to not just Chinese people, but black, Hispanic, Italian, Jewish, East Indian, indigenous, you name it. And you, you can actually ask uh, Minister George Chow about it, because that's, that's actually where he lived when he first came to Canada. But it's through that lens of both discrimination and inclusion, right? That's the flip side is that this 30, you know, this LSG group, um, you know, comprised of 36 uh, citizen members coming from varying backgrounds um, who volunteer so much of their time to, to really conserve what is so special about this neighborhood. And, you know, that, you know, continue to work to ensure that Chinatown's cultural legacy continues. The challenge is, Facing Chinatown are complex, as we all know. You know, gentrification. You know, loss of legacy cultural businesses, the erosion of housing for Chinese seniors, the opioid crisis, housing affordability, systemic barriers to accessing governmental uh, services. You know, these are just some of the significant challenges facing our community. And before you even, you know, throw the grenade, you know, known as COVID into the mix, which exacerbated these challenges even further. The LSG's official mandate is to advise on projects and initiatives that will, you know, uh, that will support Chinatown's bid uh, for that UNESCO World Heritage Site designation. You know, on how these projects and initiatives 
our work on, as you've heard throughout uh, Chinatown Reimagined, um, through some of the films, uh, the short films that have been uh, showcased, you know, the low income and gentrification working group, small business, economic, uh, sorry, economic development and cultural heritage working groups, relationship building, public education, capacity building, street safety, Northeast Wall Street working group, and, you know, the housing advocacy working group. You know, countless hours have been spent by, you know, volunteers um, in these working groups, both um, by the memory members who, you know, generously volunteer their hours, uh, experiences, skills, and their passions to this cause. And, you know, it's been, you know, the, the work that's been highlighted has been, you know, such significant accomplishments during these uh, past three years. But Chinatown Reimagined is not just about the past three years and beyond and before that as well, but also what's the next phase of work needed in Chinatown. Um, the volunteer members of the Chinatown LSG have been so fortunate and privileged to be able to work directly with city staff and council um, during this period. But Many of us have come to realize that, you know, this patchwork of volunteers, however passionate, you know, we are, we all are, you know, may not be sufficient or hasn't been sufficient to properly address um, many of these complex issues facing Chinatown. We saw that, you know, as volunteers, you know, we were strategizing, planning, meticulously executing, but we continue to be behind the eight ball. Um, case in point, you know, we, we, you know, you may have heard about. Granville Island, you know, during the pandemic, receiving $39 million in COVID um, uh, emergency funding. Well, Chinatown received nothing, you know, and when what we heard was that, you know, it, was, it wasn't just that because, you know, Granville Island was owned by the government, but they had a dedicated staff and an organization to advocate early and directly um, to the federal government, you know, and an organization that was created and supported by the three levels of government during the 70s when at the same time they were actively tearing down Chinatown. You know, that's that legacy of systemic racism popping up again. So having said that, I think the collaborative model that LSG has piloted to bring stakeholders um, from across the Chinatown community from varying backgrounds and, and perspectives, you know, that and to work with the city, that's a taste of what's to come. But I hope we can get to a point where, you know, folks like myself and, you know, many of the other volunteers are working on these projects, not just on the side, right? I'm so proud of the work we have done so far. And, you know, for, my, for me, I can say I can I reaffirm, you know, my commitments to, to working to ensure Chinatown continues to be that inclusive community and to work with neighbors to ensure that, you know, Chinatown's unique cultural heritage it's conserved for future generations, regardless of the UNESCO designation or not. But I also want to I'll wrap up by saying that I want to thank all of you here that are that care so much about Chinatown and you know spending your precious Saturday uh, here to reimagine the future of Chinatown. These challenges continue to be immense. And I know that for so many of us that are passionate about Chinatown, you know, that Chinatown, you know, even though it's at risk, it's not going to go anywhere without a fight. And I'm just hopeful that the future will not be entirely volunteer uh, driven, but that's okay. Because even if we're a patchwork of volunteers, um, we all love Chinatown and we're willing to put in the hours and that's why we're here. So um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael, for that, for those um, kind of reflection of the work and the dedication of the legacy stewardship group. You know, I think what you, what you started to map out as well is kind of the, the is, actually reflecting what what Fred spoke about as well around um, around volunteerism and that kind of that uh, grassroots organizing and how it how it needs to formalize um, to become sustainable and um, and to maintain impact and, and volunteers are always critical in community development and in community building absolutely um, but what you're pointing to I think is um, is the need for um, some, that type of formalized support so that uh, so that volunteers can bring um, their their all of their work and their passion, but be supported by by um, by an organization. So it's really I think you you started to answer the, the the final question. We'll come back to that later. But thank you for that. And, and I also want to flag that you know your your comment that you know the UNESCO de designation is an important 
aspiration. Um, but regardless of whether or not we succeed in that, as we work toward it, the work around Chinatown um, and the um, and um, and continuing the development and the the, the evolution of this in commu inclusive community that grew out of out of um, out of discrimination, but is so inclusive um, that. Uh, that we that we evolve that cultural heritage for the future together. So I think really, really thank you for those uh, kind of for continuing that discussion of how how we um, how we work together as as community, as government, as nonprofits to um, to build uh, to build futures together. Okay, so on our next uh, speaker, I'm delighted to introduce um, uh, another well-known and respected community leader and advocate who's made a real difference to the city and the community in this country, Sunny Wong. Sunny is the president and creative director of Pamazaki Wong Marketing Group. He serves on the board of many different institutions, including as a founding member of the internationally recognized International Dragon Boat Festival. He's currently a board member of the Chinese Canadian Museum of Society of BC and is also an appointed member of the City of Vancouver Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group, leading its cultural heritage working group. And recently, Sunny founded, led, and produced the national grassroots anti-racism movement, Health Not Hate. Welcome, Sunny. Uh, thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, hi, everybody. Great to be here. Um, today, I'm zooming in from uh, my uh, offices downtown on the traditional unceded territories of the um, Squamish, Musqueam, and Salatooth uh, First Nations. It's it's wonderful to be here. The the, the one thing that um, that I should know for everybody is uh, Sandra uh, did a great job of introducing me. But the other thing that I think um, is important to note is that I'm born and raised in Chinatown. Uh, hence my emotional connection to the area and my strong desire to help in, in any way that I can with the resources and, and network that I have to, to really make a difference. Um, Fred and, and, and Mike are far more eloquent than me, so they're able to speak without notes. Um, but I do have a PowerPoint presentation that I want to share with you. And having been part of the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group for the last uh, um, couple of years, it, 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 it occurred to me that the, the solutions in Chinatown are, are immense. And I've, I've been in, in and around Chinatown uh, for more than five decades and thought, okay, is there something that we could do that really allows perhaps an institutional approach to, to change the, the future of Chinatown? And I really wanna emphasize that this may sound as if there's some futurity to it, but, but there isn't. It's very much based in the present. And that present means that here we are today and everything we can do today and tomorrow is going to inform what happens in the future. So over the last number of, of months and, and, and years, um, I, I begin to think about how we can solve Chinatown and, and to really take a solutions-based approach to it. Um, so this is an aspiration, but uh, this uh, fortunately has been supported by um, the Chinatown LSG uh, already and hopefully has an opportunity to, to move forward. So this is a, a bold vision to, to reclaim and, and really look at the uh, potential of Vancouver's Chinatown. Very much look, uh, I think, addressing what Fred was talking about uh, earlier, the vitality of Chinatown, but how do we take that uh, and move it forward? Not necessarily in the same way as we've seen in the past, but in a way that uh, recognizes the past, but perhaps um, envisions a bold new future that incorporates changes in, in the demographics, changes in the, the overall mix of, of the city of Vancouver, and I think, and I think changes uh, um, socially what's happening in the world today as well. Um, the, the thinking really began with, with this kind of, um, of insight. And, and this is what Albert Einstein said, and I think this is very appropriate to, to the issue, oops, very appropriate to the issues that we're seeing in Chinatown as well. You know, um, it's, it's a different time. Um, we are facing different situation in the world. There are many, many different kinds of problems. And certainly Chinatown has 
fallen into the 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 um, the social issues, the the issues in the world that, that are beginning to um, come to the fore. Mike mentioned uh, racism, so we can't solve the same problems with the with the kind of um, or we can't come up with solutions with the problem uh, by applying the same thinking uh, for all those issues that were created uh, beforehand. So if we can't do that, then perhaps a new way of thinking is what we need to, to take to the fore and begin framing our thinking as we move forward. Um, the guiding principles for this thing called the Chinatown Cultural Trust, I should have mentioned that before, um, takes into uh, consideration um, a number of different um, things. Um, in the last number of years, um, being involved with the, the LSG, I saw a lot of protectionism. We, and if you look at, uh, look at it writ large in the United States, when Donald Trump was in power, uh, very much a protectionist mentality. Well, what's that, what that means is you shut out new ideas. You shut out um, ways for, for other individuals to come to the surface and be able to offer assistance. So let's move from being a protectionist area to one that allows us to resurrect ourselves. Um, let's move from a rundown place and you know, Mike said earlier uh, when you mentioned Chinatown, you know, a lot of people have a very positive sense. Yes, that's true. But on the flip side, it also uh, pretends to a different kind of sentiment too, and that is, well, it's a little bit run down. Sure, but let's move it to a place of renewal, and let's move it from a place that seems to be dying to a place that is is living. But the really interesting parts about this is we have to do things differently and uh, we have to be willing to have difficult, difficult discussions. Um, there, there, there's, there's a lot of um, niceties, but at the same time, we have to really look at these things in the eye and to be brutally honest with ourselves and begin to have these kinds of conversations that get us to the objectives that we want to, to accomplish. Um, acting more and talking less, um, solving problems and not necessarily presenting them as obstacles. Um, very often, I will, I've certainly, I've seen that, you know, a problem is presented and we stop. Well, let, let's not stop. Let's look at those obstacles and say, um, how do we solve this obstacle? Because if this is in our way, then we need to solve the obstacle in order to continue to move forward. It's it's a um, it's a um, one step forward and two steps back situation, but at least that allows us to move forward. Um, bringing in new ideas and, and people, um, I think in in this era of greater intersections, um, Chinatown needs to be able to reach out. I, I I'm quite involved in the film and television industry. And, and I know uh, Ho Yen, when he speaks later on, is gonna bring this up as well. Um, why not bring the film and television community or find a way to collaborate with them? It's the, the Vancouver and BC is the third largest film and television production center in North America. Let's find a way to embrace these kinds of economic and cultural sectors to make us stronger. Um, let's also look at pursuing collective interests. Uh, Mike earlier talked about the, the um, um, illusion of um, Chinatown with Granville Island. Well, Granville Island has a, um, a body that can coordinate. Chinatown doesn't. And what that allows them to do is pursue a collective vision, pursue a collective idea of prosperity and bring the individuals together. And I think that's what we need to do as well. Um, and also moving with uh, resolve and, and urgency because the, the, the last 18 months have not been uh, kind to Chinatown because of COVID, uh, but I dare say the five years before that haven't been nice to Chinatown either. So we really have no time to waste. And I, and I really want to emphasize, and I'll say this again, the, the idea of urgency being a, a, a really important imperative in everything we do. Okay, so what is the Chinatown Cultural Trust? It really is an organizational approach to the issues that we face in Chinatown. And I'm just gonna read this to you because it's quite long, but um, hopefully you're able to, to get a sense of it. Um, it's an institution that holds, preserves, and enhances the cultural legacy of Chinatown as its core, supported by a cultural charter, management trust, and land trust. 
fueled by economic development, public-private partnerships, and public engagement, all fostering a sense of place that is distinctly and culturally Chinatown. The Chinatown Cultural Trust is a living institution that will evolve and lead Chinatown as a cultural entity, providing sustainability for its residents, business owners, communities, and visitors. Now, that is, I'll leave it up for another few seconds. It's a mouthful. When, when you look at it, you, you might say, wow, that's, that's really big. How the heck are we going to do this? Well, fortunately, there's also a, a very elegant model that, that allows it to, to come to fruition as well. Um, and, and I've expressed it visually here through um, th three circles, um, starting in the center, culture and heritage. Um, and it says cultural charter underneath that. The next layer above it is a management trust and a land trust. And the next layer above it, uh, public-private partnerships, public engagement and economic development. Um, so it's, it's a lot, but I think it's well-formed and that it, it is fairly um, intuitive in, in how this could be as well. So I'll take a, a few more minutes and go through each of these individually. Um, so the first component is culture and heritage. Um, I, I, along with Fred and Carmen, me um, co-sponsor the culture and heritage uh, working group of the Chinatown LSG. Um, I firmly believe, as, as many do, that culture and heritage is the core of Chinatown. Without culture and heritage, there really is no Chinatown. It's just a place of businesses it's a place that people may walk by to do the groceries and, and to buy um, products and, uh, and services. But it's culture and heritage that makes Chinatown what it is. So the Cultural and Heritage Working Group of Chinatown LSG has uh, put together a cultural charter. Um, not quite finished yet, but really one that we think should be um, the, the emphasis and, and the core as to what Chinatown should be because that is without culture and heritage, there is no Chinatown. So the, that becomes the core, but and everything that the Chinatown Cultural Trust does will go back into investing in the culture and heritage of Chinatown. It's surrounded and, and um, allowed to move forward through two things, a land trust and a management trust. So uh, a land trust, well, what is that? It's taking, um, assets in Chinatown that are underutilized land, for example, and finding a way to turn it into revenue generating, an op generating opportunity. Uh, let's look at the Chinatown Plaza, uh, where Florida restaurant is, there's a parking lot attached to it. So what if that underperforming piece of land were provided and put into the Chinatown Cultural Trust and a way was found to uh, develop outside investments to, to optimize its use, to begin to generate revenue, and of course, to establish it as a cultural um, entity in Chinatown. So it could be the Chinese or the Asian example of Italy, a food emporium that, that um, not just has food, but um, um, goods and services as well that all relate to the um, um, Asian foods, which of course is a cultural as aspect of, of um, Chinese culture. Uh, the management trust, is um, bringing management and professional services to uh, many businesses in Chinatown, particularly the, the legacy businesses that don't have an opportunity to, uh, and the wherewithal to understand uh, professional management services that can allow them to move forward in a more positive way. And the third layer are um, three things, um, economic development. So perhaps working with uh, various economic sectors to provide um, enterprise funding to various um, businesses in Chinatown, um, public-private partnerships, bringing in corporate sponsors uh, as an example. Um, one that comes to mind immediately is you all are familiar with Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Well, they have, it's, it's one of the greatest um, areas or what greatest centers, I should say, in, in the U.S. that is incredibly successful with public-private partnerships. Uh, bringing in um, banking partners, for example, um, other organizations that really um, allow them to um, generate an, a, a new revenue source that may not have been there before. Oops, pardon me. 
and um, public engagement. Um, I, I will use myself as, as an example of somebody who grew up in Chinatown, but when I went to school, I, I moved away and I came back to Chinatown in the last number of years. There are many others like me, and, and Fred uh, earlier alluded to that as well. Lots of people who have been in and around Chinatown that perhaps don't have the same kind of connection as they had before. Let's bring them back. So the approach really here is, is quite straightforward. Um, the, the cultural trust allows a um, coordinated approach amongst all stakeholders. It treats Chinatown as a concept and a place. It, it really looks at the entirety of Chinatown, not just buildings and businesses and, and institutions. It really takes a more holistic approach and, and, and brings to the fore this whole idea and concept of Chinatown. It takes a solution-based approach to everything that, um, that I think is a problem that Chinatown faces. It brings leadership to the fore and a can-do attitude when perhaps um, an organization like this may not have existed before, but taking a coordinated approach. And, and finally, it's, it's an idea of urgency. I've mentioned that before, but you know, if somebody asked me, well, what, what, what is the thing that China can, Chinatown can be doing? Well, it can be doing this. The best time to have done this perhaps is five years ago. The second best time to do it is now. All the problems in Chinatown already have solutions. We just need to act on them and, and be bold and be um, courageous in coming to the fore and saying, these are the solutions that can solve the issues that we have for Chinatown right now. So where do we, what, what's our North Star? Dare we be, dare we aspire to be the most celebrated Chinatown in the world? I think so. It doesn't mean that we're the largest, we're the ones that when anybody in the world says, well, what's the best Chinatown? It's one in Vancouver for all these different reasons. It is up to us to determine what those reasons are, but I think that's a challenge before us, but I believe that with the collective minds here, it's a challenge that we can solve. Thank you. Sunny, thank you so much for that. I think um, you know what you've described is so compelling and it's, um, I mean, it's just so compelling, and you know, like the vid, like just the the idea of kind of an organization and um, and a unifying organization for Chinatown, one that has a clear vision around culture and heritage, strategic focus on on partnerships and engagement and economic development, and and the tactical underpinnings of of management and and a land trust to underpin it. And and you're just it's a very very compelling vision and it's based on I think on a on a, a successful trust model that we know and we've we've learned can succeed so very very compelling thanks to you and the and the and the working group uh, and of course your sense of urgency uh, that I think we all feel around Chinatown uh, so thank you for your for your work and leadership on this uh, I'm now pleased to welcome Dr Imogene Lim who is our next speaker. Dr. Lim is an anthropologist at Vancouver Island University, and for the past two decades, she's focused her research on Vancouver Island, ethnicity in Canada, and Asian Canadian history, including food and culture. She's been active in serving her community in various capacities, including through the Cold Creek Historic Park Advisory Committee, the BC Legacy Initiatives Advisory Council, and the Premier's Chinese Canadian Community Advisory Committee. Imogene is also currently on the board of the new Chinese Canadian Museum Society of BC. Welcome, Imogene. So thank you for the introduction. And I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Sinanaimo people who have been the stewards of this land and water and have welcomed all the guests like myself who have come here. So I am speaking as a representative of the uh, Chinese Canadian Museum, and I'm just gonna, oops, Let's, okay, whoops, okay. Technology is getting ahead of me. So I was asked to represent the Chinese Canadian um, Museum. And one of the things that I wanted to say that was not mentioned is 
I'm a descendant of two Lowaku uh, communities, so from Cumberland and from Vancouver. Um, and I think in being asked to speak, it has offered me an opportunity to think of, as I say, those who came before me. And at this point, I'm thinking of my family, but I'm also thinking specifically of my uncle Harold. So in this, this image, <laughs> you know, it's my introductory, but you see me as a little girl. And that image is thanks to my uncle Harold, who was um, a, phot a photography uh, advocate uh, as such. So I, I do have included in this PowerPoint uh, historic photographs as such, and they are thanks to my uncle. So I view that I'm representing his legacy to the community in this particular way. So over the last uh, two days, yesterday and today, what I've been hearing a lot of is stories. And already I knew that I was gonna talk about stories, but it really is the stories that bring the community together. And in one of the previous talks, there, there was a statement of the lost generation. So if my uncle and my aunts and uncles were, were still alive, they'd be that sort of fiery, rah-rah, we're gonna do stuff for Chinatown. So, so here are these images that remind us of the vibrancy of what Chinatown was. So as I say, the bright lights of the big city, but the big city was actually in Chinatown. Uh, it was a place of dynamic energy and it wasn't just for, yes, Chinatown, was a refuge, a, a sanctuary for the community, but it was more than that. There were people who came because we had a Chinatown. Uh, the picture in the, the corner is celebrating my grandmother's birthday. So, so back in the day before there was a flota where people would, you know, go to dinner or, or for, for lunch or whatever, you would see somebody that you would know. And I think that's an important thing to, uh, to, to remember, the importance of what the place, the, the various uh, businesses meant to the community. So when it came to eating, it wasn't just a tourist place or just to get food. It was a place that everyone was welcome. So, so you had that whole range. You had the quote unquote fine dining, you had the entertainment kind of place. And then, you know, people will remember, uh, okay, people older, but not the 30 the, the somethings, but the ho ho or the ho in, those are pl places that they served everyday Chinese food. And when there was uh, no longer ho-ho proper. There was the foos ho-ho. And that is where community gathered together. And I think that's an important thing to remind ourselves that Chinatown was a gathering place as much as a place of, you know, economic uh, opportunity. Because when you think of, of restaurants, people that got their start in the restaurants they opened up other restaurants. They're not necessarily in Chinatown, but they opened it up in other places. So, so Chinatown was an economic driver from the get-go in, in a way that's not necessarily obvious to the larger public. And with the Chinese uh, Canadian Museum, we're reminded of some of those stories. And uh, you can see that there's some of the ceramic ware used in these long past uh, restaurant establishments. But then you have this modern, uh, or I should say contemporary uh, painting of eating dim sum. And, and this, is, this is again gathering, but it's also gathering a family, friends, and other individuals. So this sort of I, I wanna keep reminding people that Chinatown was a place for everyone. 
So these are, you know, I don't know what year this was, but look at the crowd. It's amazing. And you look at the, the one on the right hand side, and it's like, those aren't just Chinese Canadians. They, they're, there were quote unquote white folk in this image. And uh, you can see that there was, you know, uh, obviously a celebration going on and, and the vibrancy that events bring to Chinatown. So, so more recently, I'm reminded of light up Chinatown. So I, I happened to be in Chinatown and I was with a friend and they said, wow, what's happening? You know, and, and, and other people were saying, I haven't seen this many people in Chinatown in who knows how long. So, so you know, again, what Fred had been talking about, events brought people to Chinatown and it wasn't just for the Chinese uh, community. So I think about the Chinese uh, Canadian Museum and how uh, it is in its programming, bringing people to Chinatown, raising that awareness of the community and what Chinatown has to offer, not just to Chinese people, but to the larger community. And one of the things uh, in the kind of programming that uh, the Chinese Canadian Museum, so, so one of the more recent ones, they uh, partnered with a number of different groups to offer a community screening of the first episode of British Columbia and Untold uh, History. And there were speakers, um, and one of them was Elder Larry Grant. You know, so, so those of you who, who know Elder Larry Grant, he's an amazing speaker. But when you, when you also have Elder Grant, you also know that there's gonna be uncomfortable conversations. And that's, that's important. You know, because one of the things that we've already heard about is the racism that was in the community and that there are people who do not know the connection between Indigenous peoples and the Chinese community. So when you have somebody like Elder Larry Grant, you bring those two communities together in this one person. And as I said, you have those uncomfortable conversations. So by having those uncomfortable conversations, you can move forward because you, what is the basis for our understanding of Chinese Canadian history and presence in the community as such? The other thing that I would say about the programming, so the programming may, for some people say, oh, well, it's just about Vancouver. Even when we're talking about Vancouver, we are also talking about other locations. So I, I just put this, up, this slide up because uh, this came out of the BC uh, Legacy Initiatives Advisory. So there, there was a, a committee set up to note where are these significant um, Chinese Canadian sites. But the thing is, those sites are only significant in the sense of who's remembering. So, so, so a lot of Chinese Canadian history has been erased because who are the gatekeepers? So when you are in those smaller communities, the Chinese community that had been there, many of those people, when it's time for retirement, where do they go? They come to Vancouver. So there's still that connection to those uh, external areas outside of Vancouver and Victoria. And I always like to, th to think of myself because I am coming from Nanaimo. I am speaking for those very many smaller places where erasure has occurred. And this is where the Chinese Canadian Museum uh, makes its presence. So one of the events that we had was Qingming. So even though we're talking about Qingming, we're still bringing in communities that no longer are actively existing as such. So in that particular presentation of Qingming, we talked about, you know, how do, how do we know that there were Chinese Canadians there? Well, you go to the cemetery. So here's one of the cemeteries. 
Ashcroft. So, so in the slide, you can see it was established in the 1890s and last used in the 1950s. So again, who is there now to remember that history? So thinking about the Chinese Canadian Museum and the seat at the table. So I've got a couple of slides here. Uh, some of the, you know, displays the information that is being conveyed. So it's telling you that the Chinese community was vibrant. Again, not just about serving uh, Vancouver, they were serving much more. So, so the larger image, it's Gim Wong, ride for redress. So yes, he was from Vancouver, but what he was doing was for all Canadians of Chinese descent that were impacted by uh, legislation, the head tax. So the other thing is, my grandfather was a head taxpayer. So, so, so these are stories that still need to be told. And the Chinese Canadian Museum, you know, is one of those places where these stories can be told. So this is my last slide. And um, in the upper image is a, the sea of faces. And, yeah, and you can see it as, as soon as you walk into the building, that's one of the first things that you see. So this is our past and present. The future's not up there yet, but you can imagine <laughs> that in those earlier presentations, those 30 somethings or maybe older than 30 something, their faces are going to be up there at some point. And with the Chinese Canadian Museum, one of, so I'm gonna ask eventually a little bit, there's this Chinese proverb, and I love this proverb because it says, tell me and I will forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I will understand. And I see the place of the Chinese Canadian Museum as involving community. And, and not just the Chinese Canadian community, but everyone. So if you have that understanding, I hope <laughs> that there will be less racism, that there will be that sense that Chinese Canadians were here early on building BC, building Canada. So now I'm gonna just ask um, whoever's in the background <laughs> to play soul because when you see that, so every time I see it, I, I, I feel something in here. So thank you for uh, allowing me to, to speak and to represent the Chinese Canadian Museum. Thank you so much, Imogene. I, I completely agree. When I see that video, I just, 
I'm sure like others, I feel chills as well. It's, it's so moving and it really speaks to the potential as you described of the museum to um, reveal the history that was erased and to play a role in ensuring that the history of tomorrow is more inclusive and representative and um, and and also as a as a force for um, for justice and for change. Um, and so thank you for your leadership and your and your work. Um, next, I am in uh, will introduce our final speaker for this afternoon, and I know that uh, we're going we're going a bit long, so we'll adjust the uh, the final remarks. Um, uh, but we have such great, uh, such great speakers with us this afternoon. I don't want to cut anyone short. Um, so finally, we're welcoming Dr. Ho Yun Lee. Um, Dr. Lee is a co-founder of the postgraduate and undergraduate programs in the Division of Architectural Conservation Programs at the University of Hong Kong. He's been appointed by government agencies in Hong Kong, mainland China, and overseas and as, as an expert advisor or a consultant for conservation projects and the designation and monitoring of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. In 2018, Dr. Lee was invited to visit Vancouver and gave talks on the feasibility of Vancouver pursuing a UNESCO World Heritage Site designation. Welcome, Hoi Yin, and thank you for joining us today. And we particularly want to thank you as we know there's a really big time zone difference and it's very early morning for you. So thank you for waking up with us. Thank you, Sandra. Um, before I begin, um, yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, I'm an outsider, I'm not Canadian. So, um, and, uh, and if um, I'm, uh, as an outsider, if I, uh, uh, if I speak out of line, you know, please forgive me. Of course, you know, my role here is not to, uh, talk politely and uh, agree with everyone. And uh, the reason why Bobin, uh, Henry, you know, and gang, you know, and uh, asked me to uh, be a speaker. And it's because, you know, they know me, you know, that uh, I'm very good in putting food in mouth. And so my role is really to provoke people into thinking. And uh, in the process, I'm sure, you know, I'm going to be speaking out line. So do forgive me. Um, and uh, just to um, make some connection here, you know, and uh, so Fred you know, talk about uh, your grandfather, right? You know, who is a, a railroad builder. He came from China to build the railroad in Canada. That happened to my great grandfather. He was one of those uh, railroad builder. And, uh, and my grandfather was a community leader in Canada. He was, uh, according to my my grandma, late grandmother, and my parents, you know, um, um, Hong Moon Tai Lo, you know, he was one of the triad leader, you know, and, uh, yeah, a terrorist at the time. <laughs> and he, um, yeah, he was uh, one of the uh, senior leaders of the Chinese Mason, and he helped raise money uh, and uh, for Sun Yat Sen's uh, revolution. And he was uh, for a while, you know, and uh, acting as Sun Yat Sen's uh, English secretary when uh, Sun Yat-sen came to um, North America to raise money for his uh, revolutionary uh, causes. And by the way, you know, and uh, the one thing, the proudest thing of my family relating to Sun Yat-sen is that Sun Yat-sen owed my grandfather money, true. <laughs> and, uh, but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Henry, I had a discussion with him uh, this, uh, before this uh, event and uh, together with uh, uh, organizers and uh, Henry wanted me to bring up uh, this idea of cultural infrastructure uh, in Chinatown and I was thinking like cultural infrastructure that's a very abstract term you know and uh, something very dry how am I going to pitch it to uh, and make it relevant to uh, today's session about the past present and future of Chinatown then I look up the definition of cultural infrastructure then I realized that oh okay finally I realized what the Henry was talking about you know Henry I think you're here, right? You know, Professor Henry Yu. And uh, so the definition of cultural infrastructure is um, places where culture is experienced, participated in, showcased, and exhibited or sold. Mm, that makes it very relevant to today's discussion and it echoes a lot of uh, the, uh, the previous speakers' um, uh, uh, concerns. You know? especially like a sunny, sunny don't go away, you know, I'm going to put you on the spot. And so if you look at Chinatown today, you know, and how is Chinatown going to be experienced and participated um, 
and uh, by, by Canadians in general, not just the Chinese community. And how is Chinatown being showcased, exhibited or sold, you know, to, uh, to Canadian first, you know, and then to the rest of the world, you know. And I find that, I don't know, as, a, as an outsider, there's a lot of past, you know. I think you guys are stuck in the past, you know. You need to, I'm not saying that the past is not important. You need to get out of the past, you know, and you, by looking towards the future and think of something bold, you know, and I'm going to quote from Sunny, you know, envisioning a bold future for Chinatown. Yeah, you have to be bold and courageous. And uh, what about audacious? Doing something audacious, you know, to promote Chinatown to the future. By, and in the process, you will help to sustain the past. In my, in my teaching at Hong Kong U and uh, the University of Hong Kong, I always challenge students to think outside the box, you know. And uh, when we come to cultural heritage, and, and uh, cultural heritage is that, uh, and it's only relevant to certain generation of people. If you're not going to bring it forward by repackaging it, but and uh, by doing things in a way to act like what uh, Sunny is saying, to act in a way you know to make it relevant to the future generation, you're gonna lose it. I mean that's the fact. And so how do we do that? So that means there's um, um, a challenge for Vancouver's Chinatown in branding, in marketing, in image making so reimagining chinatown so how do you remake the image of chinatown to canadian first all canadians and then to sell it to the rest of the world and well if you look at hong kong or hong kong has done something um whether intentionally or, or otherwise you know, that uh, through movies and suddenly talk about movies tv you know um, internet medium and uh, this is a uh, a very powerful tool you can use you know, and not only um, create a very um, to sell Chinatown to all to the world you know, but also it's a potentially revenue generating means and uh, look at Hong Kong Hong Kong is very big on uh, encouraging uh, uh, a movie Hollywood you know, to make movies in Hong Kong in settings and uh, and and over time, you know, through these especially sci-fi movies, and uh, a lot of people have uh, all over the world, younger people have come to uh, um, get interested, get curious about Hong Kong because it's being sold, you know, on the on the silver screen as uh, in terms of its uh, contrast, the just uh, positioning of the past and the future. So you see a very um, like a um, something like a like a future dystopia, but. And, uh, but yet, you know, underneath it, you know, like think of Brake Runner, you know, you still see you know, all this uh, very traditional element of um, cultural heritage being, being uh, uh, going on, you know. And Singapore is the same thing. Singapore doesn't have a long past you know, and it has a diverse cultural um, uh, composition. So how do you create something, you know, that is truly Singaporean? I'm speaking of Singapore because I grew up in Singapore. And so today, you know, I think most people would see Singapore as a very futuristic city. And uh, Singapore for the past 20 years or so, you know, has invested a lot in building up a very, uh, in, a, in a very bold way, you know, uh, in uh, creating very bold architecture to, give, to uh, give a very powerful image of Singapore. But within this powerful, tangible infrastructure and architectural infrastructure, and you, and it, Managed to retain uh, this very uh, distinctive uh, Singaporean um, cultural elements you know, like food and whatnot, you know. And uh, so, and this is this just the positioning using the future to bring out the past, you know. I think that seems to have worked for Singapore and in many ways in Hong Kong. And um, I mean, some, I think uh, some people might, might, might say that, uh, you know. And uh, using the future, making movie, we got to be careful, right? You know, we do history, we do documentary, we do more positive thing. I think we have to get out of that, right? You know, I think um, um, Canada, I admire Canada in uh, doing the right thing in trying to get the Chinese community and Chinatown out of the past you know, and out of this, um, this whole uh, racism thing, you know? I mean, eventually we got to have to let it go, you know, and uh, look forward so that the Chinese community in Canada will not be seen as Chinese, but as Canadian, a part of the Canadian conversation. And this is what Singapore has been trying very hard to do and what the Hong Kong younger generation is trying very hard to do as a Hong Konger, regardless of your, your ethnic background. And uh, so um, 
Yeah, so um, uh, the Hollywood thing, you know, and going back to the Hollywood thing and uh, Hong Kong and among the sci-fi community and uh, in Hong Kong, otherwise, you know, and Hong Kong prides itself as uh, the city outside Japan most destroyed in sci-fi movies. You know, oh, how about that? <laughs> yeah, Michael is laughing. <laughs> she get it. <laughs> and um, and uh, what else, you know? Uh, yeah, so like Korea, Korea is a case in point, you know, you see whatever means uh, sometimes it's so audacious, you know, but, and people like get to know about Korea as a hip, cool place, you know, and everybody want to go to Korea to experience this uh, hip, cool thing, but at the same time, you know, and, uh, and the cultural heritage gets sneak in, you know, and, uh, and people get to experience the traditional part of, uh, of uh, Korea as well, you know. So think of Squid Game, you know, yeah, Squid Game, everybody loves Squid Game, right? You know, I know, you know, it's a, it's a very violent movie, you know, but now, you know, Squid Game, Korea, yeah, you know. So how about doing something like that? And uh, Sunny, don't go away, where are you, Sunny? And I like your, what you mentioned earlier, you, you, you say, you know, uh, how do we envision a bold future for Chinatown? So envisioning a bold future for Chinatown, this is Sunny's word, not mine. And uh, this, I think is a very good, and uh, slogan for, for, for Chinatown's future and uh, towards uh, world heritage or otherwise. Actually, whatever you do, you know, if you use world heritage as the ultimate goal, you know, and whatever you do along the way, you know, will be very good for Chinatown. So it, it doesn't really matter eventually uh, Chinatown will get um, uh, world heritage or not, you know, but I hope it will, you know, and, uh, but if you work towards that and you do something bold and courageous and even audacious, you know, and, uh, and you'll get a lot of positive results. Uh, let's see, what do I have, you know? And uh, so, and uh, Sunny, Sunny mentioned about the film and TV um, uh, community. So bring them in, you know, not just only make historical and uh, uh, documentary and think about movies, uh, any kind of movies, you know, and uh, how about the internet media? Uh, the YouTube, you know, think about uh, Name We, you know Name We, right? The younger people will know, you know, and recently he made a, a music video, you know, it's got like uh, 14 million views and within seven days, there's one million view a day. You know? So, and, uh, but Name We, I know he's a very controversial, not controversial, he's, uh, he's a very provocative uh, person, you know, he like to provoke people. And, but that's his, uh, his stake. You know? And uh, so what, the thing is that uh, he has been hired, commissioned by cities in Japan and in Taiwan and to promote the, uh, the cultural tourism of these cities. You know? so, so that works, you know, to provoke people actually work. You know? So I think my time should stop right. So I think I better stop right here. Thank you, Sandra. Great, thank you so much, Hoyan. That was really, really uh, inspiring when you think about all of the possibilities of how to, how to um, forefront um, uh, Chinatown um, and brand it and market it to a, um, to kind of raise the profile. Thank you for that. Um, oh, Sandra, so, one more thing. Yeah. You know, I have to add. You know, I know why uh, Bobin and uh, and Henry forced me into this uh, this uh, this forum thing. You know, and I know that they knew. You know that uh, I'll be talking, uh, raising something very uh, audacious and speaking online, right? So they just want me to get all the hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we've had we've had like quite a diverse range of ideas and opportunities highlighted through the panelists um, this afternoon, ranging from kind of leveraging emerging cultural infrastructure to creating new, um, new organizations to, um, to, uh, to position the community, like the cultural trust, discussion of multi-sector partnerships and, um, and uh, new branding approaches the discussion and comments around the critical adjacencies of Chinatown as a living community and, um, and that it's not an island and that uh, it's part of a, a, a whole that it, that is um, interrelated. And so quite a lot to think about coming out of the, out of the comments of the panelists. Um, we're at 423, so we don't have a whole lot of time for, for question and answers, but a few have been highlighted um, from the from the audience, there's a handful, so I think we'll probably get to a couple of them. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll start with um, with this one that came in for Sunny, um, which was, can you elaborate on the difficult conversations that people must be willing to have? And in your mind, what do you think are some of those most important conversations? Ooh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> Well, um, 
the, the difficult conversations really, I think, have to do with um, old generation, new generation, insiders, outsiders. Um, I, while I grew up in Chinatown, I'm actually an outsider. I'm considered an outsider. I don't belong to any um, association. I don't belong to any business there. Um, I am part of LSG, so that is my primary involvement in Chinatown. Uh, yet the, the, the many organizations and associations that are part of Chinatown are um, people by individuals who have been there for generations. They have um, sensibilities and um, processes and styles that they adhere to, and they don't want those, they don't want that to change. So they don't necessarily feel that the world around them has moved forward or, or that it's even despite the fact that it's moved forward, that there is a status quo that needs to stay in Chinatown. It, it, it kind of reminds me of, of my parents who, who are now in their 90s. Um, when, when they came to Canada, their culture, they brought their culture with them and their culture was stopped. Yet in China, things begin, continue to move forward. Things continue to evolve and change. And you go to China today, it's very modern. Yet my parents lack that modernity that has allowed, um, that has made them stay almost um, um, stilted in time. And, and I think that, that to me represents the kinds of difficult discussions. It's the, it's, it relates to, again, you know, continue, allowing things to move forward and, and being stopped in time and saying, well, I want things to remain the same because I'm comfortable with that. So I think it, that, that's, that's one uh, indication of it, but in a way that does cascade into other areas as well. Thank you for that. Yeah, Imogene, and then Fred. Okay, unmuted. So, you know, I agree with what Sunny is saying, but the, the other thing that we haven't acknowledged is the Chinese Canadian, okay, I can't even speak now. The Chinese Canadian community is not a monolith. So you have people who have arrived at different points in time. So their, their sense of what it means to be Canadian is totally different. So when you're a recent immigrant, you, and if, especially if you come from a country where you were part of the majority, you don't have any sense, like I grew up uh, learning that being silent is a way to save yourself, to protect yourself. So if you come from, like I said, you come from a country where you're part of the majority, you know you could be a loud mouth and not have something happen to you. But because of my background, that is different. So, so that you're going to have the, these people competing with, like, that's not a problem. And this is why the Chinese Canadian Museum is important to, you know, people say too much history, but if you don't have some of that understanding of history, you don't, you take for granted the rights of being a Canadian. And that is really important. Thank you. Fred. Oh, I understand what uh, Sun is saying. Okay, he's thinking about the generation gap. Okay, most of societies in Chinatown they are represented by the older generation. And the younger generation try to get in, but at the same time, you know, because the board controls the purse. And what happens is that uh, anytime that the younger generation the want to raise a project or raise some questions, the, unfortunately, it's turned down because they, hey, that's too expensive or whatever. Now, I think that you know, uh, up till now, the Chinatown transformation team's been doing a very good job. And I think, you know, they can play a role. And they just, you know, in, in, in trying to, uh, what I call bridge, the gaps between the older generation and younger generation. And they, they you know, they can be the conduit of discussions 
And I, you know, it, it's just, uh, uh, if uh, the Chinese information team is going to continue on, they should, you know, it should be represented by, you know, I would say a senior manager of some type. And I hope the China Science Transformation Team will continue because you know, it's very important role that they can play acting up a bridge in these organizations. Great, thank you, Fred. I can confirm they will continue. Um, Michael. I just wanted to yeah you know, echo those sentiments that Sonny said. It's you know it's and also Imogene. It's like you know you've got these different backgrounds, experiences. You know it's not just age either, right? Like it's just different lived experiences and mindsets. You know some people have been very you know distrustful of government in the past. You know because of you know so much of that those racist policies in the uh, you know from previous uh, governments as well, uh, but. You know, as, as Fred was saying, it's like it, it is about, you know, how CDT and LSG as this model and, you know, along with uh, the Chinese Canadian Museum of bringing people together to have that collaborative discussion on and, you know, events like this, like the summit of how do we work together to move Chinatown forward, there are going to be disagreements. And so these are the difficult discussions that are going to continue that, you know, that Sunny has alluded to. Uh, Fred, in his remarks, talked about the, the, uh, the Hoifeng. Uh, association and that's this this new youth group that uh, that that sh that uh, formed in the 60s because they didn't have an avenue even into the old guard associations back then. So this is we're seeing history repeat itself with organizations like the Hua Foundation, Yaro, Baobe, um, and so many uh, other you know and youth uh, collaborative. Uh, so many these young next generation you know Chinese Canadian groups, right? Because we feel this passion to help shape this future. Um, so yeah, there's gonna be a lot more difficult conversations and um, we're, gonna be, we're gonna have them. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, this is a segue into the next question, which is, um, which I think is, is, a, is a, a complex consideration and it, and it draws from Fred, your original observations and, and Michael, yours as well around the, around the adjacencies that uh, that impact Chinatown and comment the kind of your comments um, kind of observe the adjacency to the, the the downtown east side Oppenheimer district and the challenges there. Um, we're also looking ahead to the development of Northeast Falls Creek and the significant population densification that will come through um, and the new communities that will be built in that area and some of the new spaces. And um, and I that it is a it is the topic of very mixed um, responses um, and concerns for many for many people um, in uh, um, in Chinatown and and also um, and also there's uh, uh, some excitement and so there, it's really mixed. So anyway, from the from the pan from the audience, um, uh, I feel that the future of Chinatown will be substantially impacted by the city's plans for Northeast Falls Creek. Um, of which Chinatown has been neglected, would welcome concerns or comments from the panelists. And so I would invite panelists to think about what are the, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities that are presented um, with, uh, with the discussions around Northeast Falls Creek. And Hoyan, you raised your hand. So should I jump to you first? Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Right. Thank you, yeah. Sandra. In fact, I'll be very interested to know, you know, um, if there's any uh, comment from the, the younger people, you know, in this, uh, in the, among the, the audience. And uh, but, but before we do so, you know, and uh, Michael, I keep seeing you, you know, have this naughty smile on your face, you know, I, I know you're starting to think, right? You know? So you are the, the martial artist, right? And uh, so maybe you could do something more audacious, you know, and uh, like, uh, um, something like an event, like the Kung Fu Fighting Chinatown, you know, I know it's cheesy, you know, people like cheesy. You know? and, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and uh, this uh, uh, Henry just was at me, you know, and he said that, uh, he said, oh no, you know, now Squid Games, Chinatown is going to become a meme, a meme. <laughs> okay, I hope it will, you know, so that will get people to think about Chinatown. I mean, the whole point about this, uh, Doing something audacious, you know. You keep using the word audacious. I'm sorry, I keep coming, coming uh, out of out of left field, you know, and uh, just to provoke people to think. I mean, this really to get people to get excited and to think about Chinatown, and uh, so that that goes back to your point about this um, 
difficult conversation, right? You know, and uh, so, and I keep saying that, uh, and uh, well, it's the Chinese I can say that, right? You know, I mean, you got to get out of this uh, constraint, historical constraint about racism and all that, you know, and and move on. So if you're going to start in that uh, and uh, Chinatown, you really are going to face a high risk of losing the 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 core cultural heritage of Chinatown. So how do you make it go past that, you know, and uh, be able to, to laugh at yourself, you know, and uh, so the people can laugh with you, you know. And uh, so, well, you know, my wife, right, you know, my wife's wife. And uh, I think the reason why we, uh, we, 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 we married you know, is that uh, I'm able to laugh at her culture, you know, as much as she laugh at mine, you know. Yeah, we say all the, all the yeah, we equal um, opportunities, uh, equal, opportunity uh, races you know and uh, among ourselves and, and my wife keep wanting me and say ah you can't just can't take my husband out uh, and uh, he always say the wrong thing and he actually my wife actually gave me a list of things not to say in public uh, when i'm when i'm in the states <laughs> but anyway so yeah that's the point you know and uh, so what uh sandra what are some of the comments from the younger people you know whether yeah. they hate me or not you know well, I was just thinking I need to give my husband a list of things he's, he shouldn't say. <laughs> I think I'm going to use that. <laughs> um, Michael, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I think we're going Jeopardy style. So whoever goes, yeah. uh, puts your hand up first. Um, but Ho Yen, I respond to your comment about us being audacious and about, you know, I think we are trying to be audacious. While at the same time, I challenge you on this point about not forgetting that historical racism. I think we, it's not, yeah. but not letting that anchor us down, but you know, but yeah. be mindful of it. And when I say audacious, audacious, like, so this cultural trust that, you know, Sunny's posited uh, and presented to us uh, as an idea of a way that we can move forward, you know, to me, that is like insane. Like, this is going to be like years in the making of work that, that will be happening, but I'm so excited about it. You know, when we first started talking about, you know, the idea of this cultural trust and what that could mean you know, to bring us all together, right? In an organized fashion, an institution to help Chinatown move forward, um, you know, organized way. Because yeah, it really is like, we're all here today because we're all so passionate about Chinatown. But most of us are volunteers. Like there's definitely a lot of city staff here as well. But for the rest of us, like we all have day jobs. Yeah, right? and we Michael, all have I'm things. Michael, I'm going to interrupt you for a second here, yeah, I'm sorry. And uh, you said, yeah, you're right, you know, I mean, to get out, to move on, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that forgetting it, you know, but we built on it in a very positive way. This uh, past racism thing, right, you know, this historical, whatever negative thing in the past, you know, we all have that, you know, and, and, uh, the, thing is that, and uh, the thing is that we cannot be too woke with W-O-K-E about it. Now. Once we become too woke about it, you got to sh sh people are going to shy away. Absolutely. And people are going to be very cautious, you know, and people are just going to be like, yeah, let's stop touch it. Let's stop touch Chinatown. So I, how I see that happening is like, let's, band, you know. yeah, let's, let's catch their attention, festivals, cultural events, and then we educate, right? Because yeah. that's, that's a part of it. It's like, how do we, you know, like the museum, like there's lots of things to see and do there. And, you know, we like light up Chinatown, lots of things. And then once we, and then you, t you tell them about that history yeah. because so many people don't know about that. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. use audacious thing to relax my um, non-Chinese friend, right, in the States, right, you know, my brother-in-law, you know, and uh, so they talk about the past, you know, and then they, they become very, uh, you know, being very, they're very culturally aware, sensitive people, they talk about uh, past savory and all that, they say, oh, my ancestor did okay. that, and I told them, say, yeah, my ancestor probably washed your laundry, you know, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, you say something outrageous like that, yeah. you know, just to relax them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, Sunny, I see your hand up. And then I also have Richard Wong has his hand up as well. So Sunny, we'll move to you. And then Richard, will we'll come to you. Yeah, I, I think what Hoi Yin and, and Mike are talking about, and, and I agree with, is just the, the ability to surprise. You know, I have a marketing background. And the one thing that I always try to inject in everything I do is this element of surprise, because that's what's going to make a difference. Uh, in, in any encounter, you know, is that fast thinking, emotional reaction to, to something. But I want to go back to your earlier question about, you know, South, or Northeast Falls Creek and, and, and the downtown east side. Um, I, I do think the, the idea of coordination is really important because each of these areas uh, maintains themselves or operates in a distinct fashion. But I think if we took, again, you know, the, the cultural trust writ large 
and have a way to bring a coordinated approach to these different areas as well, then I think that's going to be a key in moving forward. It's, 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 it's attitudinal adjustment, but I think, you know, it's also being inclusive and, and being able and willing to collaborate and understand the different uh, personalities and individuals who are working in these different areas to allow us to take a coordinated approach. So, you know, Chinatown is a place and I really like the idea of, of placemaking, but then you can't do that without the greater context around it. And I think something like a cultural trust, because it has the overall neighborhood of Chinatown as its core, it, can't, it won't therefore forget that it has neighbors as well. And being a good neighbor, of course, is always a positive thing and moving forward, as we all know, because we probably have our neighbors and if you have a neighbor you don't like, it's gonna be hell. Thank you. Um, Okay, we have, uh, we're running out of time, but uh, I do wanna uh, give Richard Wong a chance if he's been uh, trying to raise his hand. So Richard, uh, just a few moments and then we'll, and then I have a final question for each of the panelists and then uh, we'll, move, we'll move right into um, our, uh, our farewells. So Richard. Thank you. I just want to make three quick points in response to the topic today. I think from now on, Chinatown's future is changing. Changing is because we have the active and enthusiastic involvement of younger Canadian-born Chinese participate and taking as a leadership in the community, like Sunny Wong, Michael Tang, Carol Lee. We have the light up, you know, Chinatown. We have the fire dragon. We have the museum, the Ch uh, Chinese Canadian Museum. You know, with the guidance of uh, you know uh, senior like Fred Lee and uh, uh, Fred Ma and uh, Imogen and so on. This and this year, this couple years, with the support of Vancouver City and the province, the John Declaration to to fund and support declare with a memorandum to try to make Vancouver Chinatown as a UNESCO destination. That is a very important. Right now, they are opening support with financial and with commitment, one thing. And secondly, I want to respond to uh, Professor Ho Yen's about the suggestion of UNESCO. One thing, I personally have been working on this issue. How Chinatown unique to relate to UNESCO. One thing, in the last 200 years, the main Chinese community from China is from Seyap, Toisan, Hoiping, so on. What do they have relate to UNESCO? Is Hoiping, Diulang. Okay, so for your information, we can sort of relate to our, the root of our ancestor who built this Chinatown from Seyap Hoi Ping. The history of Diu Lao, you can read it, you can Google about Diu Lao. Okay, we can bring this, what one of the projects I'm doing now in Vancouver, if this successful with Ming Sun, the building redevelopment, it will be the first Diu Lao in Canada. Why? Because we will bring the spirit of Dilau to Vancouver. Because the Dilau was built in Hoi Ping and Tai San, it's because our pioneer had brought the Western construction and material cement back to Hoi Ping and built these concrete buildings to protect the, the women, the children, and the elder from bandits and so on, and the war. But anyhow, another thing I would like to share with you, there will be a lot of activities in Chinatown. A couple of years ago, before the pandemic, when we are doing the Canadian flag raising ceremony, we have organized 68 lions, dance, and dragons, together with the annual 
uh, Chinese New Year festival, parade, and so on, I can see more and more things will happen. So Chinatown will be more and more vibrant. That's all I want to share. So I have full hope with the support of all of you, Sandra saying, and so on and so forth, Chinatown will be very, very prosperous. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, it is, uh, so it is 4.45, and I'm supposed to be doing closing remarks right now. Um, but uh, so, but, and I hope you'll, into, and I know we're heading right into Saturday night, and, um, but I have to say, I can't imagine a better way to have spent my, my Saturday than, than in this discussion. So I wanna just thank everyone for this. I will though ask, even though we're tight on time, each of the panelists in, in 10 words or less, what is the one most important thing you think uh, that you would like to see happen in Chinatown to advance a positive and prosperous future? Maybe 20 words or less, <laughs> but, but, uh, but tight, and, tight and fast, please. So I think we'll go in order of our original speakers. Um, so Fred, I'll start with you. I already said it, but we must resolve health and safety and homelessness problems. And I think the city should lead and ask the two senior levels of government to sit down with you to discuss how to resolve this. Fred, I, I really agree with you. Thank you. Um, Michael. Um, yeah, I think it's really, I'm excited about this, the, you know, the possibility of an institutionalized uh, format to bring people together in, in the same way that LSG and CTD have been working together, um, you know, driven in an institutionalized way versus a patchwork of volunteers. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that I agree that's critical. Um, Sunny. I think the, the greatest solution is attitude change. It's people, organizations, institutions in Chinatown changing their attitude from one of closed-mindedness to open-mindedness, to one of insular to um, outward uh, looking. So because if the entire attitude changes, then it cascades down to all the organizations and, and um, entities in Chinatown. So attitude change, but that's a big, big job. You know, Sunny, I wonder if, um, you know, I think that that attitude change probably is beyond the community as well. It's, it's how government works also, I would think, um, and, and private sector. So just want to, to open that up. Um, thank you. And it gets to that quotation that you provided around, we can't solve the problems of today with, with the same thinking that created them. So thank you for that. Um, Imogene. So I'm going to just say, I support what Fred says, because if there's no safety and well-being in the community, you can have a pretty building, but if the problems, you know, the external problems are still there, it's still going to be a problem. So, you know, the success is about getting that uh, tri-level government support to, you know, taking care of those neighborly yeah. issues. Yeah, I think it speaks to that every neighborhood is part of a bigger community yeah. and we're, we're so interreliant on each other. So thank the, you the, the other thing I would say, if, you know, our neighbor was Kitsilano, it would be, you know, like if Kitsilano was next to, like if Chinatown was Kitsilano and there's still the downtown uh, east side, we, there wouldn't be a problem because it would be fixed up. It certainly speaks to influence. Yeah. Right. And um, and who has influence? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Hoyan. Um, OK, six words and uh, envisioning a bold future for Chinatown. And that's an exact quote from Sunny. <laughs> Thanks, Sunny. And uh, even though Kung Fu fighting Chinatown is not bad either. I'm, I'm saying that for Michael Spanfin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank what, about, you. what about cowboy boots? Oh, I'm wearing one now. Yeah. <laughs> cowboy boots, yeah. Cowboy boots trying to town. That's not bad, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you all so very much for um for your time and your sharing your thoughts and ideas for the trajectory of this work and um from the past through to the present and into the future. Really, this was a really fantastic and wide-ranging discussion. So thank you so much for that. And I have to just say, as a city administrator. It's so incredibly exciting to be a part of a discussion like this and to hear the diverse ideas. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it was a great reminder of how 
um, how our best solutions do really come from community. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'm just gonna, we're gonna, uh, just because we're heading in toward five o'clock, we are going to uh, change the, uh, uh, the agenda a little bit. I am going to head right into some final remarks. It's my privilege to, to offer those on behalf of the forum planners. Um, but before I do that, I just wanna to do a reminder that all of the sessions have been recorded and will be posted on the forum website um, as part of the legacy of the forum to, the, to one of the previous speakers uh, earlier today was commenting on the importance of, of documenting these discussions in this work. And so that is definitely happening. Um, and uh, and so um, I'll just uh, kind of segue into some reflections just around how important um, the the last two days have been. And thank you all for joining us uh, for this discussion. And um, the uh, uh, as you know, this part this forum was convened by a partnership between the City of Vancouver and the UBC Initiative for Student Teaching and Research in Chinese Canadian Studies, INSTREC, uh, in short, um, as many know, um, and the. Forum has been a culmination of a three year long process with community to work toward both the revitalization of Chinatown and to explore the UNESCO World Heritage Site designation. And as we're all aligned, the vision um, of this designation um, and the vitality that, uh, that will come from the work is to realize Chinatown's potential as a full potential as a cultural destination for both our city, for our province, for our country, and for the world. Um, and also to some of the discussion today, this afternoon, to pass on the community's cultural heritage and legacy to future generations. Um, I would like to thank the UBC team um, under the leadership of Professor Henry Yu. This, uh, they're so inspired and this dedicated team of over 30 students developed and curated content for the project website, which serves as a virtual exhibition space showcasing the people, places and key topics of interest in Chinatown. So I would encourage everyone to check out the website. Um, I also want to thank our own team here at the city, the Chinatown Transformation Team uh, that Fred uh, mentioned and, and, the, and many of the speakers mentioned today, who collaborated on curating the six interactive sessions um, over the past two days and who worked with partners, including the Asian Film Festival and the Chinatown Heritage Society Buildings Association to produce some of those really wonderful documentary films, um, which we saw part of them today uh, during our uh, sessions, but also are all online. Um, and I, I also want to, to Michael's um, comments from this last session, all of this work is inspired and supported by members of the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group, appointed by council to guide us as staff. And just wanna thank the Legacy Stewardship Group for their tireless work, vision, leadership, and partnership over the past three years. Um, this type of volunteer leadership, um, and as we spoke today, needs to eventually be institutionalized with, with supports, um, but, the, the passion and the leadership and the courage and the vision is, is, is what will make a difference. And um, the many impactful initiatives that you've already uh, championed and continue to champion in Chinatown. Um, in total, over 175 people contributed to the planning and execution of this forum. And we're grateful to each and every one of you, um, uh, participants, organizers, speakers. And we've considered a broad range of topics ranging from reimagining public spaces, seniors care, new and legacy businesses, language revitalization, a different identities, community-based storytelling, evolving leadership, celebrations, activation, um, and just such a wide range of topics that, that um, contribute to a community's development. And, um, and so I just wanna say like, it's been such a privilege to engage with speakers from the local, provincial, national and international arenas. And you've all generously shared their deep understanding and knowledge about Chinatown, our hopes for the future and the role of this community as a local and global cultural district. Um, and so what we had here today, I, like, over the last couple of days, I think um, has been a milestone opportunity to reflect on this community's resilience against the backdrop of many, many challenges, um, both geographic and, and, um, and global, um, to celebrate the community's many accomplishments to date, to celebrate um, the history and the contributions of, of, of many of the residents and the emerging contributions and the, and, the, and the leadership of tomorrow, and to hear bold visions and tangible ideas for the foreseeable future. 
Um, so on behalf of the organizing partners um, and, uh, and the staff, I'd like to thank you all again for your contributions. Um, and to Fred's kind of comments in the last, um, uh, in the last session as well, that uh, we've, um, this has been a long journey over the last three years of laying out a vision and building capacity and establishing key partnerships, including the MOU with the province and the Legacy Stewardship Group. Um, and that Chinatown transformation team that is supporting this work will continue. And as we head into the next phase of our work together, we look forward to continuing the preparation on that site application for the UNESCO World Heritage Site, including being in a favorable position for the for the federal review of the of the, the national list and continuing to support the broader work around community and economic development and social development. Um, and Chinatown is a gem of the city of this province of this country and it's our work together is critical to ensure it it evolves and grows um, and uh, um, and that we can truly um, have the 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 really remarkable cultural heritage reflected in in a vibrant future so thank you all again thank you for uh, for staying with us until uh, five o'clock on this Saturday afternoon and again can't imagine a better way to spend to spend a Saturday here in Vancouver thank you all <laughs>